Photographer Eve Arnold took this photograph in 1955. Asked about it later on, Miss Arnold explained, the copy of Ulysses was anything but a prop. Marilyn was reading it at the time of the photo shoot and had been carrying it around. By all accounts, Marilyn was an avid, even passionate reader, and both casual and posed photographs often capture her around books. Interestingly, Monroe is clearly reading the final chapter of Ulysses, and that chapter had caused so much of the scandal of the book. That chapter, called Penelope, consists of Molly Bloom in five incredibly long, expressive, uncensored, and often deeply erotic sentences, musing over the course of her life and loves as she slips towards sleep. I am absolutely enchanted by the thought of Marilyn Monroe encountering and really performing Molly Bloom in her mind. And Ulysses, of course, still had a fair amount of notoriety in 1955, since it had been frequently subject to censorship or confiscation and was banned in the United States from before publication until the landmark Judge Wolsey decision of 1934 opened the way to U.S. publication. But censorship of one form or another was all around Marilyn. At the time of the photo, she was secretly dating playwright Arthur Miller, who was always running afoul of the censors. And in the single year of the photograph, 1955, Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita was banned. And that year, too, Allen Ginsberg gave the mesmerizing performance of Hal at Cafe 6 in San Francisco that opened the gates for all sorts of legal actions, both against Ginsberg and about other beat poets and playwrights. Even Robert Aldrich's great film noir version of Mickey Splane's Kiss Me Deadly of that year yielded to the pressure of the censors and lopped off a couple minutes of the final scene, which was only restored in the last decade. So let's start with the ban on Ulysses and then move on to Molly Bloom and then discuss censorship and sometimes imprisonment of members of the beat movement and close out by viewing the crucial scenes in Kiss Me Deadly in its uncensored form. The 1922 publication of James Joyce's Ulysses by the fearless and indomitably spirited Paris bookseller Sylvia Beach was an epochal event in literary history. Fearless and indomitable and even heroic fits in many ways for Beach. One of them is that she risked disgrace, the loss of her business, and arrest for publishing Joyce's masterpiece. Miraculously, it all worked out. Though after publication, copies of the book would be confiscated, including by the United States Customs, where it remained a banned book until December 6, 1933, when Judge John Woolsey ruled that however brilliant or boring, honest or disgusting Ulysses was, it was not obscene. But Joyce's work had from the beginning been subject to unceasing censorship from all quarters, don't tell the truth about people. Don't tell how they actually speak or what they think about or what they actually do in the course of a day. It was that simple. Printers, publishers, and public arbiters of taste wanted a tidied up, idealized, and sanitized version of human beings. Joyce is really the ultimate realist about our lives and wouldn't budge and this was just too much. If a drunk character in a bar is going to use the word bloody in a description, Joyce would too, and you better bloody well believe it. Joyce's refusal to bend on the word bloody helped tie up the publication of Dubliners for years. Four years previous to the publication of Ulysses in book form, the similarly heroic Margaret Anderson and Jean Heap published most of the book in serial form in the pages of their magazine, the Little Review. They served jail time and confiscated issues for their efforts, and the cluster of troubles helped destroy one of the great literary magazines of all time. And so here it is, in March 1918, the first appearance of the first chapter of Ulysses. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came down from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather, on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. The yellow dressing gown, ungirded, was sustained gently behind him in the mid-mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft. For this, O oh, dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine, body and soul and blood and oons. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. Oh, little trouble with those white corpuscles. Silence. 
all. Molly Bloom's soliloquy at the end of Ulysses as she is drifting off to sleep is surely one of the most lyrically and poetically intense passages in all fiction. I got him to propose to me, yes. First I gave him the bit of seed cake out of my mouth, and after that long kiss I near lost my breath, yes. And he said, I was a flower of the mountain, yes, and we all are flowers of the mountain, and oh, that awful deep down torrent, and oh, the sea, the sea, crimson sometimes like fire, and the glorious sunsets and the fig trees and the Alameda Gardens, yes, and all the queer little streets and the pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jasmine and geraniums and cactuses and Gibraltar as a girl, when I was a flower of the mountains, yes. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I say, yes, my mountain flower. And first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad. And yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. Imagine it is October of 1955, smack dab in the middle of a conservative decade that puts a high value on conformity, and you are in the sixth gallery in San Francisco about to attend a poetry reading. And after some fairly conventional poems, you hear a young man begin to read. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix, angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night who poverty and tatters and high and hollowed eyed sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz. Is it beat down? Is it the beat of rhythm? And you look at Allen Ginsberg's face who's still reciting how and speaking of angel headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection and suddenly you know well yeah maybe it's beat of tatters and beat of outcast and beat of rhythm but it's also the beat of beatitude. Almost everyone in the audience of the 1955 evening of Hal's first performance were mesmerized by the fusion of deeply personal revelation, erotic candor, and social critique in Ginsberg's poem. But more to the point, almost everyone in the room had the sense that this event marked a new beginning, not just for Ginsberg, but for the whole beat movement. For everyone in the room was intoxicated by the sense that Ginsberg was elevating the revelation of inner truth to a whole new level of expression. It wasn't just a question of language anymore, but of freedom and of human identity. The event was a birthing of a more complete sense of the human and a freeing from gags of the past, and everybody knew it. But news of the event quickly rippled out onto those who would want to damp down the complex truth of our full human being in the name of censorship, clinging to a weird sense of what decency means and to a belief that social control is maintained by limiting what human qualities can be expressed. These arbiters of taste and decency started gearing up for the attack on the beats. Soon, the publisher of the poem, Lawrence Ferlinghetti of City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco and a clerk in the store would be arrested and hauled off to jail for selling, quote, indecent works and the legal attacks or the pressures of censorship and banning would spread to other beats, including William Burroughs and Jack Kerouac and Gregory Corso and Leroy Jones and Diane De Prima and really anyone who insisted on exploring reality in the revelatory and honest and uncensored way essential to the beat credo. The complex individual stories of censorship are fascinating, but so many of them converge in this photo in a way I find absolutely breathtaking. It is a 1959 downstairs in City Lights bookstore, a place I've been hundreds of times, and Allen Ginsberg is proudly holding what might be considered some of the offspring of his 1955 howl. 
The gathering of books in Ginsburg's hand is astonishing, and in an upcoming video I will discuss and read excerpts from every one of those volumes, Jack Kerouac's Dr. Sachs and the Subterraneans, the truly amazing second issue of the Evergreen Review, which was devoted entirely to the beat scene in San Francisco, Big Table, which was the answer to the earlier banning of the naked lunch issue of the Chicago Review, and it simply prints the issue in its entirety including the first chapter of Burroughs' book. And then there is Yugen, published by Leroy Jones and Hetty Cohen, which is by far my favorite beat publication. Measure was a New York-based beat publication. And then there's Gregory Corso's Bomb, one of the most interesting takes on the arms race and Cold War ever, and also Corso's first book, Gasoline. And then, of course, there's the epoch defining Hal and other poems, which in addition to Hal contains such masterpieces as America, and a supermarket in California. I mentioned Yugen was my favorite among all the Beat periodicals, and there were many of them. But it was the inspired publication of Beat poet Leroy Jones, later Amiri Baraka and Hetty Cohen, who took the title from a Japanese word they defined in the magazine as meaning a profound, mysterious sense of the beauty of the universe, along with an awareness of the sad, beauty of human suffering. Sounds like about the most acutely poetic sensibility one could ask for, but I think the first issue might indirectly have more to tell us about the nature of censorship towards the beats than any other single document I know of. Let's first take a look at a couple poems by Diane de Prima. Then I turned a face, no longer trusting, in the white shadow petaled like lips, to the thousand and first erstwhile unloving lovers, and we trod homeward together unbound, but caught in the timed pulse and thrust of green hard spring. Or how about for Pound Cocteau and Picasso? So you sit, robes and all, you old ones, and having broken every rule they ever made, you now preach order. Ain't you the cool ones? But let's take a look at the fourth of four poems by Allen Ginsberg, and it's called On Burroughs' Work. The method must be purest meat, and no symbolic dressing, actual visions and actual prisons, as seen then and now. Prisons and visions presented with pure descriptions corresponding exactly to those of Alcatraz and Rose. A naked lunch is natural to us. We eat reality sandwiches, but allegories are so much lettuce. Don't hide the madness. In the very first issue of Yugen, Allen Ginsberg is writing a poem about William Burroughs' yet unpublished Naked Lunch, which is about to lead to the banning and destruction of an entire issue of the Chicago Review, which had attempted to publish the first chapter. Some of the editors created Table 1 with contents identical to the banned issue. When the Naked Lunch is finally published, it will lead to a court case attempting to ban it permanently, and at that trial, Allen Ginsberg will read his poem. And what does the poem really say? It says, we want real. We want to be able to express the depths and intricacies of the human psyche and soul without tidying things up. We want it messy. We want our reality sandwich. We want our naked lunch. We want real. Censors don't like real. On the first page of the issue of Yugen, Ginsburg has in his hands in the City Lights photo, there is an advertisement for Diane de Prima's new book, This Kind of Bird Flies Backward, with an introduction by Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Out of the heart of the ineffable draw the black flecks of matter, and from these the cold blue fire. Dry water. Immerse yourselves, though it be but a drop, the Iliaster flowers like the wind out of the ash, the Eidolon of the world, crystalline, perfect. Diane de Prima. Affirmation of a larger sense of self was infectious to audiences. They loved her. So how do you go from that kind of sensibility to an FBI letter from J. Edgar Hoover slamming de Prima and slamming Leroy Jones for their new Floating Bear Poetry magazine as obscene and making derogatory comments about government officials. It all worked out, though, as censorship often did for the Beats. Howell's acquittal on charges of obscenity loosened things up for other publications and brought an enormous amount of fame to Howell and 
to Ginsburg and to the Beats. The Prima and Jones later were hauled off to jail, but insisted on a grand jury hearing. Jones brought in a large stack of books that had at one time been banned as obscene as his primary evidence. They ranged from Sappho to Catullus, and then he read from James Joyce's Ulysses. Jones read aloud for many hours to the grand jury. I imagine it was an eye and heart and perhaps even soul opening experience, but in any case, the jury rejected the charges as without merit and Diana and Leroy walked free. Finally, in the very same year as Nabokov's Lolita was banned in the United States and the same year as Ginsburg performed Howl to a mesmerized audience and the same year as Maryland is pouring over the infamous Ulysses, Kiss Me Deadly, that brilliant wedding of noir on steroids and Cold War angst, has its apocalyptic ending lopped off to appease the censors. Who among those who has ever seen Robert Aldridge's 1955 film, Adaption of Mickey Splain's Kiss Me Deadly, can ever forget the edgy spectacle of Cloris Leachman running panicked and barefoot and dressed only in a trench coat toward you out of the menacing night? But it wasn't this scene, nor the crazy sexual banter or violence that rankled the arbiters of taste and decency. It was the ending where Mike Hammer and Thelma escape to the waves as the house they flee blows up in a nuclear explosion. It was just too much for Cold War anxiety, so almost two minutes was lopped off the end. Here are a couple highlights from the film, followed by the restored version of the ending in all its horrific glory. And now, fellas, we'll hear that fine new platter by Nat King Cole. I'd rather have the blues. <sighs> that bus stop will be coming up pretty soon, and I don't even know your name. Forget I'm a loony from the Laughing House. All loonies are dangerous. You ever read poetry? No, of course you wouldn't. Christina Rossetti wrote love sonnets. I was named after her. Christina? Yes, Mike. I got your name for the registration certificate, Mr. Hammer. Get me to that bus stop. You can forget you ever saw me. Don't make that bus stop. We will. If we don't, remember me. Thank you. 